Good morning. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. We've lost a rock. I'm told that I have 10 minutes. <laughs> I don't know how one consolidates over 50 years of a bond to 10 minutes. However, <laughs> I became aware of Maya Angelou, as she was named that time, on the cover of a Calypso album where she dared to sing Calypso tunes. Now, I am a product of the West Indies, and my sister and I sat down and played it and picked it apart, and <laughs> how dare she, <laughs> really. Went over all right. I mean, I wouldn't challenge her. I first met her in 1960 in a play called The Blacks, with my a Frenchman, Jean Genet, it's the play, I believe, that's responsible for avant-garde theater in this country. It is the seed of every actor of note today. It had a cast, Maya, Roscoe Lee Brown, Godfrey Cambridge, James Earl Jones, myself, Chuck O'Donnell, that was the basis of black theater today in America. It was my first play. I was sitting in the front row waiting for rehearsals to start. And I heard this booming voice who was challenging someone about something. It scared the daylights out of me. <laughs> I thought, oh God, this must be the boss. And so I gripped, <laughs> like I, I gripped my seat and I waited. I did not turn around. When the person finally came forward, I started looking from her feet to her knees to her hip. <laughs> oh my God, I said, who is she? And someone heard who is she and said, that's Maya Angelou. Okay, all right. I said 1960, she insists that she met me in 1959. My computer does not show that. It says 1960. <laughs> in any case, that show ran for three years, and during the course of that three years, I can tell you that every emotion known to man was exhibited by Maya. She held nothing. She spoke her mind no matter what the situation was. She and Abby Lincoln were very, they were like Mutt and Jeff. You never saw one without the other. And they had uh, gotten together, and I thought if you wrote a song, you sat down and you took pen to paper and you did the lyrics and you did the music and that constituted a song. They needed a song for the piece and she and Abby stood at the piano and they hummed something and someone played it on the piano and that became the song for the show. Well, three days later, she and Abby came in demanding credit 
and pay. <laughs> and I thought to myself, for what? What did they do? I mean, uh, they just hummed something and somebody played it on piano and that became the song. Well, it became a monstrous battle between she and the producer and the director. They finally ushered she and Abby outside and whatever they agreed to made it possible for us to go on with the show. <laughs> All right, I'm going to fast forward. I had never, ever seen Maya speechless. There was uh, an institute called Mufundi in Los Angeles, and they decided to combine both the LA Blacks Company and the New York Blacks Company together and do a benefit for that institute. Well, we had a rehearsal that lasted one day, uh, and everybody said to me, now I was really a devil. <laughs> I know that myself. Uh, but everybody wanted to know what I was going to do with my hair. I said, I don't know, whatever, it was natural, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm going to wear, my hair. And so we went through a, a minor rehearsal, then uh, the following day we were to perform. Everyone in the company was downstairs at the stage entrance waiting to go in. I had not come down yet. I had not come down because all during rehearsal I had my head wrapped up in a kerchief. So nobody knew what was going on underneath that kerchief. Finally, I came down the stairs. Maya is standing at the foot of the stairs. She turns around and she looks at me. I was absolutely bald, and she could not take her eyes off me. I saw her mouth moving, <laughs> but she couldn't say a word. Finally, somebody sent for the director. He came, he took one look at me, and he said, ladies, you have your work cut out for you this evening. It's the best show that we ever did. Fast forward. One more story. Uh, when I was doing Trip to Bountiful, we talked practically every day. I just kept her abreast of what was going on. And I said to her, I'm not going to put any pressure on you, Maya. I know that if you could, you would be there. But I want you to know what's going on. And I did that every day. I had a friend coming from Los Angeles to see the show, and usually people come downstairs to their dressing room to say whatever. And this gentleman sent a message that he could not come downstairs, that I would have to come up to see him. He said, there's nothing wrong with him. What's wrong with him? I talked to him yesterday. He was fine. Why, 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 why can't he come downstairs? I don't know. So. You, you have to go upstairs, you have to go upstairs. Finally, angrily, I dropped everything I was doing, went upstairs, and at the head of the stairs was Maya in a wheelchair. It's the best gift that she's left me with. She took the time, despite the pain that she was suffering, to ride on that bus, to come all the way up to the Sondheim Theater to see me. And from what I understand, she loved every minute. This bond is a tie that never will be broken. I will love you always. Thank you.